Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar presentation. Is MQTT becoming the de facto standard of Industry 4.0? The impact of IoT on industrial automation protocols. Brought to you by Faircom. So I would like to introduce you to our presenters. Avaldo is Director of Business Development for Faircom Corporation, a high-performance database technology company which provides a complete line of data management tools and an engineering-level solution for high-speed data indexing and extraction. Joining him is Walter, who is a Senior Engineer at Faircom Corporation, a high-performance database technology company that provides a complete line of data management tools and an engineering-level solution for high-speed data indexing and extraction. Before joining Faircom, Walter was a client for 24 years. He joined Faircom because he had proven the product and wanted to become a part of the team that made the magic happen. So without any further ado, I'm going to give it to Edvaldo. Please take it away. Sure. Thank you, Rich. Let me share my screen here really quick. Hold on. Uh, just opening up here. Okay, you guys probably see my screen already. Okay. So hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us here today. Um, like uh, Rich mentioned, my name is Evaldo. I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, what we have seen and uh, working with uh, several Industry 4.0 projects out there um, and what we believe is actually becoming the, the main um, industry standard for communication, especially on, on IoT, right? So going through the slides really quick here, so just going back a little bit on the history of, of what's what happened with control systems. Um, uh, Control systems have been digital for, for many, many years already, right? So it's not new. Uh, the, the industrial environment, especially the industrial environment, has been controlled by computers uh, for several decades. Uh, as you can see, actually, it goes all the way back to 1800s, so the 1800s, right? Um, but, the, but it's going through a lot of pressure. There are many different uh, changes. SCADA systems have been implemented and controlling those systems for, for many, many years already with computers. But most of those computers are dedicated to that particular task of, of managing that application, right? So what is happening right now, what we noticed that's going on right now with the industry environment, and I think this is the major force between Industry 4.0, uh, is bringing a lot of challenges for, for those existing environments, okay? So this is a little bit of the background explaining why MQTT be, is becoming this, this uh, standard for sure. Um, one of those uh, challenges is the, the way the architectures were designed, right? So they were designed mainly to, uh, uh, to control those systems. That was the main objective and the main goal. Um, to supervise and control and, and make sure the machines are, are doing what they need to do, you know, and nothing is going wrong. Um, which means also they, they're so focused and so designed for that particular purpose that they're not easy to integrate with other systems. Um, I think this is probably the main challenge for that IoT is bringing to a lot of those uh, environments is the fact that it's not designed to be easily integrated with other environments. But there are other challenges, right? The second one I would say is, um, almost like a consequence of that, um, there are several data puddles, right? Or the data is concentrated in some in some cycles of production. Um, so it's fairly easily consumed and used for that particular purpose. But again, uh, other environments like IT especially, or even uh, uh, the cloud, they wanna have access to those data puddles, how to do that, right? Uh, creating those silos of data is, is part of the challenge as well. Um, this is all impacting several different protocols, um, mainly because most of the protocols, the communication protocols that were designed along the last decades, um, they had this, part, this particular paradigm in mind, right? They were designed for that purpose, to better control real-time systems and making sure that machines are not, are not uh, creating accidents, you know, the machines are not breaking. Um, they're mostly real-time oriented which also has um, has some conflicts with other systems out there because most systems are not real time, especially when you think about some new processes that are being implemented. Um, but but to the to the point, it goes all the way to the point of the technology itself, like Modbus or OPC UA, which is what we're going to be talking mostly here. But a lot of what we're going to be talking about OPC UA applies also to these other protocols. They were not designed with integration in, in uh, with integration mindset, right? It also it also affects other technologies, um, mainly historian databases. Uh, historian databases are typically uh, used in some scenarios where you have to do root cause analysis are not super popular, but they're very uh, still very uh, commonly used out there. 
But again, they are storing the data. And what that means is that if you have to go there and grab some data or access some of the data for other applications, that's not necessarily going to be very easy to be done. Uh, historians were not designed with that uh, mindset either. Okay. But talking specifically about OPC UA, so let's dive a little bit deeper here. So what are the main challenges that OPC UA is facing right now for Industry 4.0? Um, well, the number one is it's complicated, right? OPC UA is not a simple uh, specification. Uh, I was doing some, I was looking to the specs the other day and it's 1200 pages of spec if you wanna implement the whole OPC UA specification. It's very, very complete, but at the same time also super complicated. Um, what, which means essentially that when a vendor is building a new a new computer or a new device, a new PLC, or a new some kind of server that considers implementing the OPC server inside a machine, um, he will never implement the whole spec, right? He will have to decide which parts of the spec it's going to be implemented. So, which ends up becoming making it uh, super limited. Okay? Um, the second challenge with OPC UA, it's, and this is coming from several customers we've been working with, it's a heavy protocol, right? So when an OPC server talks to a client, uh, the subscriptions typically are not reported by exception. Uh, traditionally, you have, to, you have to pull the data, right? So you have to go there and grab the data that you want. And the data is heavyweight. So uh, this is uh, implementing OPC UA in your entire factory means be prepared to make some investment on the resources, especially on the network side, right? Um, many of the OPC uh, devices that handle OPC, the talk OPC way, uh, they have very limited capability to handle multiple subscriptions to access to that. And nevertheless, and even it's heavy overall, but yet does not provide you a lot of extra information like metadata from the data that you're collecting. You know, it's typically only the data. So that's kind of a caveat on top of the, of the problem itself, right? So being heavy is definitely a challenge. Hey, then it's not very flexible, right? So OPC UA is designed, like I said, it's designed with that mindset of being almost like this is the purpose is to control the machines. Um, this this creates some problems with uh, with uh, both modern and legacy devices when you want to integrate them with other operating systems, for example, or or connect them to different networks. Okay, OPC UA has a hard time handling uh, all the different types of data structures, you know, especially when you have heterogeneous devices involved. The focus has never been uh, to deal with other data than OT or operational technology data. Uh, and I think the solution really falls very short when you have to integrate this with, for example, big data analytics. You know, if you want to have analytics running on top of OPC UA data, it's not very simple. Uh, the fourth one, it's expensive, right? So drivers for OPC UA have been expensive for decades and have been limiting the implementation for um, to adoption of OPC UA a lot. Okay? To implement it fully, like I said, because the, uh, the spec is really large, no vendor actually ends up implementing the whole spec, which really makes you decide which, which uh, part of the implementation is being provided, okay? The architecture for OPC UA requires you to embed uh, OPC UA server into the product which also increases the cost and time to market for those products. So long story short, it's not a simple solution to be used because it can, it can turn out to be very expensive as well. Okay. Um, then, because of the paradigm that it has been designed in the past, it was designed mainly for a one-to-one -one communication, right? It's a peer-to-peer -peer communication where a client talks to a server and that's it. Uh, yes, it has some capabilities to have a one-to-many, but it's not very common. And uh, in most cases, it ends up being just a really reading one data from one server and so on, right? Um, in addition, most implementations don't really include meta metadata tags, right? So if you, if you wanna have some additional information about the tags, you're gonna have to do it by yourself. Uh, in general, this all means that if some other environments like IT wants to get access to the data, the data is really raw and most cases very limited in terms of what you what it, it's informing, right? Um, and last but not least, uh, the support is very limited. Okay? So not many vendors out there support OPC UA, uh, has been around for many, many years, but many of the new industrial IoT technologies, they do not come with native support for OPC. Um, 
mainly because of all those other reasons, right? Um, I guess Microsoft right now is one of the only cloud cloud vendors out there that supports OPC UA client client server connections if you want to pump data over to uh, Microsoft Azure to Central, for example. But the hardware participation from the IoT has always they don't they're not really super interested in investing in OPC UA in parts because of all the other reasons that we mentioned. So all those those I think that's all the main challenges for OPC UA right now. They have been there for, for decades, but they're becoming more critical because of what we think are the new paradigms that are coming with Industry 4.0, right? So many of these new paradigms are coming because of the new usage of what you want to do with the data. Right? So what 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 is the purpose of, of uh, adopting the, the, those kind of uh, architectures and technologies? So many of those, I guess the main one right now that's putting a lot of pressure on on your existing environment is the cloud, right? So the fact that so many new applications are SaaS native, that were designed to be running on the cloud, um, very powerful tools out there that are only cloud-based. It's making like 95% of the projects we've been involved, it's about how do I get this data up to the cloud, right? Properly, easily, in a trusted manner, okay? Um, not only that, but the cloud implies the web, right? So that means also, if, if you're developing new applications that are going to consume the OT data and they want that data right now, they didn't want it in the past. And in the past, there's typically like a wall in between operational technologies and information technologies. That wall is gone, right? So information technology wants the data because they have so much that you can do about that. And not only this, they also want to be able to feed back to your SCADA system and say, hey, here, here are my conclusions of what I saw that your machines are telling me. So... It, that those applications are typically web applications that do require some kind of integration with OPC UA. So cloud and web are major forces here that are uh, pushing the SCADA systems to, to change. Second one is smart sensors. So the industry of sensors is becoming more and more sophisticated. Um, and we're talking, when we talk about sensors, we're talking about things that are collecting data from in real time. You have to think in a broader spec, like for example, smart cameras. Smart cameras are seen in smart sensors. And what is a smart camera? A camera that can do image processing in real time and provide you not only raw images, but also information while it's doing that, right? So there are cameras right now that can uh, automatically detect pat patterns or change in patterns automatically and just let you know. So all this process processing is happening in the camera itself. So how to integrate that with the way OPC UA has been designed, um, it's not a simple task, uh, especially because of all the kinds of data uh, structures that the, those, those sensors are producing. Right? But if you want to adopt those sensors in your environment, you're going to have to be able to, you're going to be, have to be prepared to, to do the modifications you need to do in your system for that. Right? The third one is artificial intelligence and machine learning, right? So those are very transformative technologies. Again, they're not new. They have been around for decades again, but in combination with the cloud and, and, and the amount of resource of, of uh, a processing uh, resource that the cloud brought to the table, both artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, became very, very powerful uh, to be used inside industrial environments, right? Industry 4. I would dare to say that a lot of Industry 4.0 is really bringing, for example, predictive analytics inside inside those environments. But the data to do predict, predict, predictive analytics, you're going to have to be able to not only collect the data but also to store data because you want to be able to go back to historical data and process that information and looking for patterns, for example, and, and using historical data to do feedback, to teach your uh, machine learning algorithms, for example. Um, that all requires not only being able to collect the data in real time, but also uh, store the data in a way that those algorithms are able to go there and read the data and, and process the data, right, to, so that they can learn it. That is where we see most of the challenges on the historian databases going on right now, because th that's the requirement that those algor algorithms have. Historian databases are not prepared to serve a source for, uh, for a machine learning algorithm running on the cloud. Okay? And I guess the fourth one, it's Internet of Things by itself, right? The, the need to integrate to other systems, the need to have remote devices that all of a sudden are part of your control system as well. Uh, mobility is a major problem here, right? So the fact that you have 
um, uh, uh, SIM cards now connected to devices and sensors that are not only necessarily remote, but also mobile, moving around, and that information needs to be included in your in your data set that is that is being used to control the system. Uh, these are all all four of them are are bidirectional, right? So they want to extract data, but they want to be able to feed this data back to the SCADA system. All this is putting a lot of extra pressure on your SCADA environment, okay? So with that said, um, why is MQTT becoming so popular? You you are probably here hearing more and more about MQTT, right? It's, it's, it's all over the place, okay? MQTT is not new. As you can see, it was invented in 1999. Those are the inventors of MQTT. Um, it was created with the purpose of tele telemetry uh, mainly, so it was designed really to collect data in real time from sensors. Um, but there are a couple of things that made it really, uh, we consider this is like the critical part why it became so popular. In 2011, IBM submitted MQTT to the OASIS standard group, um, really to make it like, okay, hand it over to the to OASIS, make it a standard, right? Uh, turn that into a standard. But at the same time, IBM also open, uh, started the what they call the Eclipse PAHO project, which made it open source. So the combination of those two events uh, really made MQTT become almost like uh, 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 the way to go for all kinds of projects when in, when IoT started to pick up momentum and uh, in the middle of 2015, 14, 15, okay? So just to give you a quick idea how that took, took off, um, I put together here um, uh, a little chart, like I just did a search here for Google Trends. As you can see here, uh, I searched for MQTT, I searched for CoAP. CoAP is another protocol used for integration, right? I searched for AMQP, MQP, some of the systems out there are using AMQP to, to coordinate. Um, you can see that MQTT became by far the most popular search going on, right? So it is definitely very, very popular right now. And and the, and the main reason, in our opinion, part of the reason is the fact that it became like an open, an open source uh, pr uh, protocol made by IBM. But there are others, okay? It's not only about being, being a, an open source protocol, right? That's not enough. The reality is that MQTT is very helpful, okay? So there are many, many reasons why people use MQTT. So, it is highly usable. Um, and let me highlight some of the main features here for MQTT. Number one, it's very reliable when the communication is not reliable, okay? So like I mentioned before, mobility is becoming a major problem, right? IoT applications, they typically, they many cases, they wanna connect over cellular networks, right? And that means they have to be able to address the issue on of how to maintain that uh, the, the, that communication reliable, even though the the network is unreliable. Okay, 5G, even even all the LTE communication, we have been involved in several projects where the devices that's collecting the data, it's it's based on a SIM card, you know, and internet is on and on, right? So, cars typically, like connected car, typically is moving through dead zones with cellular network. They have to deal with the fact that the network might not be available, right? Uh, MQTT deals with that fairly well, okay? It's designed actually, there, there are some uh, implementations inside the protocol really to deal with that. We're gonna talk a little bit about that in a minute here in our own technology that we came up and Walter Walter's demo uh, is gonna show a little bit about that, okay? Um, the second thing is that MQTT is bidirectional by nature, okay? So that means not only that you can send data to the cloud, but also that you can bring data to the cloud back to the back to the environment, right? So um, most IoT applications they involve bidirectional device um, uh, from the device to the cloud and vice versa, right? In a typical scenario, device data is transmitted to the cloud, and the cloud sends control back sends control back uh, to the device. Okay, so MQTT is based on a, on a concept of publisher subscriber. Uh, the publisher subscriber means you're just pu publishing your data, you know, and you, whoever wants the data subscribes to that and collects the information that whatever he wants, right? So uh, that protocol is bidirectional by nature, okay? Third one is um, MQTT was designed to broadcast messages to many clients. Right? I think this is super critical. All the other protocols we have seen before, 
they had in, them in mind that, okay, a client will go to the server, collect the data and use the data and that's it, right? So it's a very one-to-one -one architecture, okay? Not with MQTT, right? MQTT, because it's a publisher and subscriber architecture, the publisher don't typically don't even know who's actually consuming that data. They don't care. They just publish the data. They know someone needs it, you know, publish the data and it's gone, right? Whoever wants the data subscribes to that data. So you can have a single device publishing data to an MQTT broker and having thousands of processes consuming that data. Okay? So this is, if anyone here tried to develop on a, on a solution that does just that, just doing that is really not a simple thing, okay? It's quite complicated to, to be able to develop an application that handles this kind of, of problem. There are multiple problems you need to be monitoring, like did the, did the message, uh, was the message delivered, you know? Did the message got in the right way? Was it corrupted and all that, right? This is all part of the protocol. Uh, so makes it much easier to develop an a solution that requires one to many. And guess what? Industry 4.0 and IoT, are typically one-to-many scenarios, right? There are all kinds of different processes out there that need to consume the data. Okay? And last but not least, it's fairly easy to implement, right? The reality is that because it became open source, the community took it over, you know? So you can just Google and search for MQTT and you're gonna have all kinds of different technologies, all open source, many of them free. You don't have to worry about that. You know? also really reduce the cost a lot, typically like, We've been involved in some of the some of the large um, um, IoT industry 4.0 projects right now. One of them was really super interesting to see. Like they had a few OPC UA drivers installed, mainly because the license for the OPC UA server was expensive. Uh, but they already had MQTT running all over the place just because it was free. And also, it was so simple to just adopt it and start to use it. Okay? Um, I guess to summarize. MQTT is really becoming so popular because it has proven itself, you know. Uh, it's very useful for many different IoT use cases out there. Okay? Developers can use it uh, fairly easy going to the community and finding new, new parts and pieces that they need. Uh, we know that this is the new, new way to develop applications, right? People just go and find uh, someone else that already did it and try to adapt that technology to, to, the, to themselves. Open source is fantastic for that. Okay? makes it really easy to use. And the fact that the, the, this open source community is so vibrant, providing new tools all the time, um, just the, the whole thing just took over, right? And right now, pretty much every new smart sensor that comes out in the market has already MQTT implemented by de default. You know, Any gateway for edge computing comes with MQTT embedded inside it. And, and uh, so in the end of the day, it's definitely the, the de facto standard right now, and, and it's posing uh, challenges for the existing ones, right? like OPC way mainly, okay? So how exactly MQTT works, right? Before going to the demo, we'd like to highlight a little bit for those that are not very familiar with MQTT. I mentioned here that uh, it's a publisher subscriber system, but here are some examples, right? So you have, it relies on what we call a broker, a broker is essentially a, a software solution running in the, in the middle, making sure that uh, everybody that's connected to the system is able to uh, publish data and also consume data, okay? Typically, whoever wants a data, it's a subscriber. So a process, a computer, the cloud can subscribe to a topic. It's based on the concept of topics. A topic is nothing but uh, a data set, right? So if you wanna have temperature, it could be a topic, you know, or pressure, it could be a topic or even more complex data, okay? Walter, Walter's demo is gonna show a little bit some of how the topics can look like. But you can have multiple subscribers. So if topic A is a, is a temperature sensor, for example, you can have two different processes consuming topic A. And the same process can consume different topics, right? So you can have you can have be tied to multiple different types of topics. Like for example, the second process here can be subscribing to a topic B, okay? On the left side, we have the publishers, okay? so. Whoever is publishing data, whoever knows, hey, I got data that some some process or some users want to consume, can just publish that to the broker. Say, hey, here's here's my here's a data a data point for topic A. You notice that I'm calling message one, right? Why is that? It's mainly because MQTT broker is based on messages. Okay, the M from MQTT is messages. Uh, so we're talking about uh, uh, ways to send data from a device over to other device. So whoever subscribes to a data, like for example, topic A subscribe to message one, we'll get the data from message one, okay? But we can also send it to the second one, right? So 
And so, it, so the system goes on. You can see the data starts to flow automatically for whoever's publishing the data to whoever is consuming the data. Okay? Talk you a little bit more about the message itself. Uh, right now, messages in MQTT are structured in, uh, in JSON format. So it couldn't be more useful than that, right? So you can just get any kind of structured data, put it in a JSON document, send it over to the broker, and whoever wants that data just consumes the data. Fairly simple, fairly easy to implement it. But how does that, like, how would you adopt MQTT on top of an existing environment right now? If you have an, an OPC UA system running right now, uh, how does that look like? So here's an exaggerated OPC UA architecture right now. It is exaggerated, but not too much, right, actually, because it's mainly peer-to-peer -peer and the data, the errors are showing the client and server connections. So it can get very complicated, like I mentioned before. Okay, how would that look like under an OPC, under an MQTT architecture? So same devices consuming the data, same devices producing the data. Okay, you just have a broker in between, but now they can just connect to the broker, right? And then from there, the data can be properly consumed. You can see it gets way more sophisticated and cleaner. Uh, the integration gets way simpler for you to deal with, right, and manage this environment, okay? Um, how does that affect uh, the, the communication with other environments? And I think this is the critical part, right? So, like I mentioned before, many of the systems, they're trying to be connected to other environments that a big part of industry 4.0 is building a bridge with other systems, especially the IT side, okay? MQTT is the perfect way to do that because you can just through the broker um, without without disrupting anything in your control system. So your control system can stay exactly the same. The previous picture can be running underneath this whole architecture here. You don't have to change anything. All you have to do is add MQTT as a layer to your environment, you know? And now, now you can send this data, you can make this data available for any system in the IT part. Uh, um, we have been involved in one particular project where IT was desperate trying to get the data from the from the production environment. You know, machines, PLCs controlling machines, and IT trying to uh, extract the data from those machines. And they're like, "What's the best way to do this?" And they're like, "Well, we have some OPC way implemented here, but not all of them are using OPC way. All the rest was really pretty much a silo." Uh, data puddle, like I mentioned before. Um, the solution was MQTT. Just dropped in a broker, connect MQTT to the, to the existing environment, start to publish the data over there, and whoever needs the data just consumes it, right? So it's fairly, fairly easy to, to be done. But this is this is a way to go when you're trying to get out of your OT environment and, and publish data to other systems. What about OT itself, right? So or more specifically, edge computing. So let's zoom in a little bit here on the edge computing part. What is edge computing? Edge computing is when you're trying to uh, process the data and consume the data on the edge where the data is being produced, right? So the sensor or the PLC or a tag of a PLC that is producing the data, but you wanna consume it right there, do something with it and come back. So the data typically don't necessarily goes out of the environment, much less has to go to the cloud, okay? It's it's being uh, it's being consumed and processed right there. Fairly fairly important for, for example, real-time operating system applications, okay? If you wanna have, you don't have time for, for the latency of the cloud to be involved, right? So in those cases, how is MQTT being adopted? Um, typically through an edge gateway, okay? So edge gateways are devices, single board computers, or typically a computer that you install close to your to your machines, close to your devices, your sensors, or anything you're trying to monitor. Uh, they all pretty much talk MQTT right now, right? So it's not a problem. All I have to do is to plug them in into your MQTT broker architecture. And now you have, you can have gateway to gateway communication, which is essentially what edge computing is about, right? So you can have, you have data sitting here on, this, on the gateway, sitting here that can be used and processed in real time. So this is why Farcom created Farcom Edge IoT Hub, okay? What is Farcom Edge IoT Hub? It's a combination of an MQTT broker with a NoSQL database, okay? We are a database company. Farcom is a database company. We developed our own database. It's called Farcom DB. Uh, we have a database for edge computing called Farcom Edge. Our broker runs all protocols, okay? So we can run communication with all protocols. And here's a quick picture of uh, how, the, how the integration works. Well, my voice is going away. I apologize, I just had COVID, okay. Um, I'm gonna transfer over to, to Walter in a minute here with the demo. 
I wanna show you, here's kind of how it works. The main benefit is that we can collect data from anywhere and push data anywhere, okay? So this is the beauty of the combination of the technology we did here, combining an MTD broker with a database, allowing you to map data, for example, PCUA, sending data, collecting data from here and sending out to other environments, okay? I'll stop here to try to catch a, catch a breath and also get my voice back, but I wanna switch over to Walter here for him to run the live demo, so it's not only me talking here on the slides. Walter, let me transfer this over to you. Great. Okay. Let's see, let me get the right screen showing. Uh -huh. I got the right one. All right, so, uh, so like Evaldo was talking about, um, you know, he's talking about MQTT, he was talking about, um, OPC UA and the edge server. So here I have the edge server running. It is, um, like you said, it's a full MQTT broker as well as a SQL, no SQL, SQL or no plus SQL database engine. So it's doing all of that. So I have for, you know, in order to kind of try out and get my feet wet with OPC UA, uh, you know, the company wouldn't let me buy a big industrial press with an OPC UA server embedded in it. And so I grabbed an uh, open source OPC UA uh, server kind of starter. You know, it's a it's an open source package that that uh, that's an op that's a, just an OPC UA server. And then it's kind of like insert your code here in order to fulfill the the you know to fill up the information model with the variables that you want. So what I did is I took that and I dropped it onto a Raspberry Pi, a, kind of a device like this, a little industrial thing. And then I hooked up a Bosch BME 680 sensor, which is kind of an environmental air sensor. So, and then I changed the code. You can see the source code a little bit here. I added in my code here to read the Bosch BME 680 and then return as OPC values, as OPC variables, the temperature, the humidity, the pressure, and the air quality. And then this is the tag I gave each one of these. So now I have this server that acts exactly like, uh, you know, any uh, industrial piece of equipment with an OPC UA embedded server, and I can ask it for these values. So what I did next was I went into our config file for our product, I made sure that my OPC plugin was enabled, and then I configured the OPC plugin. Uh, we ship uh, the, the OPC configuration file pre-filled with some examples, you know, give you an idea of, of what you're doing. This part is just how to connect to our internal database engine. Then you can specify the name of a table you want the data to go into, how long that data is retained, you have full control over that. It can be, uh, you know, any amount. You can you can have it retained for 30 seconds if that's all you care about. You could, like an example here, we've got to set to 60 days. Of, you know, I could do a number of months. I could also set it to never get rid of the data. So all data is kept always. So it just depends on what you need and how big your drive is. Here is where I specify how to connect to the OPC server and then how often I want it to pull the pull for data. And then here is where I define which um, OPC variables in which namespaces I want. So I give it a variable in a namespace, and then I tell it which, which um, field in the table that we specified to put that piece of data. Now this here, you can see there's two different servers doing, you know, pulling different kinds of data. So for, for my little server over here, this is how I set it up. So this is all the same. I decided to call it OPC table one because I'm so clever. Uh, I left it at 60 days. Uh, you know, this is uh, the URL for my server. I set it to read every 10 seconds. And then I told it to get those OPC tags that I, all four of those OPC tags, and then to put that into, you know, the OPC table in temperature, humidity, pressure, and quality fields. So at that point, 
all of that data would be getting pulled and getting put into our database engine. But I wanted more. So before I fired it all up, I used a little bit of no code JSON config to pre create a table in our product that is tied to MQTT. So, and it's pretty straightforward. Uh, here is, here I defined the topic, the MQTT topic I wanted related to this table. Gave it the table name, which is the same. I gave it the same table that I did in here. Whoops, if I could click on the right thing. Uh, I set the store and forward to true, which says, which tells our engine, however records get into this table, send them back out over MQTT on our specified topic. And then again, I matched the same persistence uh, setting 60 days. Then I, I had it create the same four fields so that it would match exactly what the OPC OA plugin is looking for. And then, so I fired that off first and it created the table. Then I started up the OPC UA plugin and the OPC UA plugin saw the table and it's like, oh great, this is exactly what I need. I'll just start putting my data here. Now that's actually running live. So let's go have a look at what that looks like. So now I'm switching to SQL Explorer. It's just a little web utility that comes with our product that allows me to get into the data via a SQL interface. Um, like I said, we're, we're no plus SQL. So we have a lot of interfaces that are, you know, ISAM or NAV and a lot of interfaces that are SQL. And this is operating on the same engine. There isn't any clever, you know, ETL running in the background making it look like this the same. No, no, it's the same data, same engine providing both of these. So in here, there's a list of our tables and we can see that it did in fact create the table I wanted, the OPC table one. And then you can see that it has the fields, the four fields I specified. It also gets an automatic timestamp field so that you know every time the, the record gets added, we know a timestamp that that happened and some other things that we use for internal stuff. Now, let's look at the records. This has been running a while. So I have 220 pages, let's refresh that. Yeah, see 259 pages. And if we refresh the data again, see it just added another row. So every 10 seconds, it's going out to my OPC server and it's saying, hey, give me the values for these variables. And you can see the OPC UA server is responding to that and giving it the most recent reading for those every 10 seconds. And they're into this table. So this is great. I have access to this data. Now I have access to this data over NoSQL kind of navigational style access, like start me at this record and then next, 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 next. Or I have access to it over SQL. So I can say, you know, select star from OPC table one where, you know, whatever I want. So that's great. Now the thing is, like Evaldo was talking about, I really kind of want to use, uh, I want to use MQTT because I've been having a lot of fun with this MQTT thing. It's pretty flexible. I've been, you know, it's been working great. It seems to be uh, doing well. So how do I get that to go into MQTT? Well, like I discussed, we pre-set it up, told it that we wanted it to be tied to MQTT. We set the table so that it would know which topic it was tied to. So now let's look and see if that's working. So now I'm gonna to switch to MQTT Explorer. It's another web utility that we include with the product. You can see here that I'm getting a lot of message on this other topic, which is just some of my, my other MQTT traffic that's going on. There's also this OPC test topic. So let's switch, drill down in and subscribe to the OPC test topic. So I'll subscribe there. And look at that, we've got, we've got data coming in. And another one just came in. So you can see that it took that OPC UA data. So this, this is how it worked. Our OPC UA plugin pulled the OPC UA server and said, hey, give me your most recent values. The OPC server did that. We put it into our database engine and then it got forwarded out over MQTT as these JSON values. So there you go. Now let's see, let me stop and think. Have I left anything out? I get so excited talking about this. Sometimes I leave things out. Um, I think, I think I showed everything I was supposed to. So, Havaldo, 
This is super cool, Walter. Let me let me ask you a few questions first. Uh, okay. So essentially, you have uh, our Faircom Edge in this case here is acting as the as the client connect, consuming data from the Opus TUA server you have running in the background, right? Right. Right. Through our plugin architecture. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh -huh. Would you mind going back to the JSON configuration file that you used to collect the data really quick? I have a question about that. So yeah, that's exactly. That's it, yes. So I see you have like different sensors there, like for example, tem temperature, humidity. Is this something you can change? How does that work? <laughs> yeah, I can change this uh, anytime I want. I can add a whole nother server if I wanted, as our, you know, if, like this default example shows, I could change up things. And then, you know, the, then the question is, of course, do I have to like restart everything to get that to happen? And no, because it's a plug-in architecture, I can change things okay. here and then leave the, the MQTT, uh, the, the server and the MQTT uh, broker alone, and I can just use a simple utility over here to okay. stop uh -huh. the plug-in. Now the plug-in is stopped, and then I can start it again. Well, I guess it would help back. Well, okay, there we go. And oh, the OPC plugin is started again. And every time it Without, starts, uh, it rereads the config file and then uses current configuration. Okay, files. so yeah, because one of the one of the critical things for industry for the old projects is really that devices keep showing up new devices and new new uh, data all the time, right? So it's a very flexible and very elastic environment that you want to be able to add uh, new data points as you need. So what you're saying here yeah. is that if that happens in a production environment, you don't have to worry about it. You don't have to stop the broker. You don't have to stop anything. You can just stop mm -hmm. the plugin, modify, include whatever device you want, and start it again, and we'll start to collect the data, right? Yeah, and and furthermore, you know, uh, I've, I've been in these environments before, and, you know, the, the people who are taking care of this, the engineers, you know, they got 100 things to do. This is like the 101st thing that they got to do. And so it's nice that it's all JSON because, you know, you can come in here and there's all the names and everything. It's kind of self-documenting, so you can be like, oh, that's right, here's what... Yes. Oh yeah, I got to make another, you know, another um, piece here. I can, you know, it's it's very much it reminds you of what you need to do. It isn't like a, oh shoot, how do I even work this? Yes, it it makes sense, and I guess also this is also part of the usability of MQTT, right? MQTT is JSON mm -hmm. by nature, so fairly easy to just consume the data. Actually, even human reading, right? You can just look at the data that yeah. Walter was showing us the output over there. Anyone can read the data and interpret the data, right? So yeah, um, yeah, this... I love MQTT because sometimes I forget what I named things, so I can just go in and dip into the data stream. It's like, oh yeah, humidity is just humidity. Okay, cool. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> I have a second question about your demo, and that uh, relates specifically to the uh, integration between the broker and the database. So typically, if you go out there and you try to find uh, uh, solutions for MQTT, they're either or, right? So you, uh, there's there's plenty of MQTT broker out there, brokers out there for you to use. Mm -hmm. um, they all they all rely on some kind of internal storage, but not really in a full database. So we we believe that our combination of the broker, entity broker, and our and a, a transactional solid database makes a big difference, especially because the data is is right there to be consumed. And I have a question yeah. to you about the SQL Explorer. Can you go back really quick to the SQL Explorer? Yeah. yeah. So. You mentioned that our solution is is NoSQL plus SQL, right? So here right. you're showing our our own interface for SQL Explorer, but I guess we can we have others, right? So there are other ways. If you have other processes trying to consume the data from our SQL database, how would that work? Yeah, so we have a full suite of available uh, ways for other things to connect. So for instance, we support JDBC, ODBC, which kind of just blows it wide open for lots of things to get in here and connect. Uh, ADO.net, and then, you know, like I discussed, we have many other APIs, including a nice REST API, uh, mm -hmm. Java, Python, C, C++, .NET, you know, the list goes on and on. And Super. Uh -huh. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Walter. I just wanted to highlight a few of those things. <laughs> I have a few a few uh, extra slides here to just wrap it up um, and add a little okay. bit of, a, of an, an extra um, there are some other things that, if, of course, MQTT is not only it's it's not all like not only solutions, right? There are some challenges for MQTT as, as well. Okay, um, the main one that we have seen some some customers implementing MQTT, their concern was about reliability. Okay, so how, how can I be sure that the the message is going to be delivered, right? The protocol itself has some control on that. They call it quality of service. 
So if the data is being flowing, you all of a sudden you have thousands of messages being sent all over the place. Can you, how can you be sure that no message is being lost, right? What if the, the network flickers? What if the, something happens, the, the, proper, the process that was supposed to consume it never was never there because it, it crashed or something, and then when it comes back, can you be sure it's gonna be delivered? To some extent, yes, MQT provides you some quality of that, but it's probably not enough for a mission critical environment, okay? Here's where we believe that there are some, there are some qualities, like you see, this is typically how the quality of service works on MQTT. So if you, are, you, if you are planning to adopt MQTT, keep a close eye to that, okay? It's very critical. Um, we have seen some projects failing because messages were not being delivered and they didn't know what was going on. It was ultimately a problem with quality of service uh, that they didn't, they, they were not aware of, okay? Uh, we believe that we actually improve this quality of service with the combination of the database. Because the moment we have the database sitting there, if you use Faircom Edge MQ, we actually can see like MQT by, by default, it always defaults to the lowest quality of service, right? So if quality of service is zero, the message is coming in is zero, but the subscriber is one, he's gonna get zero, right? So it may or may not be delivered, okay? We bump it up to the second level because we have the historical data so we can actually look into the data and say, oh, wait a minute, I wanna make sure this is being delivered. So just to share a little bit of the background, our background history is running with transactional uh, environments, right? So we run financial systems, we run mission critical environments all over the world. So we designed the combination of the broker with our database with the with mission critical in uh, uh, mindset, okay? So that's, I would say, number one thing that you need to keep an eye. Number two for implementations with MQTT is really high availability, right? So many customers question, well, if you have a broker sitting in the middle, it becomes a single point of failure. That is true. Right? You have to make sure that you have you you address that properly when you're designing your application to have some kind of failover. Brokers in general have the ability to, to build a failover. Um, our solution, our failover solution runs on top of our own database. So it's a database class failover capability. What that means is that when, we, when we're flowing messages through our broker, those messages are being persisted at the same time. So that gives you the ability to, if something crashes, something goes wrong, we can pick up from where, where we stopped, okay? So no message is lost. Nothing is, is, is uh, uh, if any subscriber didn't get the message when it was crashing, we're gonna make sure this is gonna be delivered, okay? So make sure, and I would I would even advise you if you're planning to use MQTT as a way to go and adopt it on top of your OPC UA environment as an extra layer to collect data, make sure you have a fillover strategy, right? It's absolutely critical. Uh, and not all brokers out there give you those abilities, okay? We have also the ability to deliver historical messages. Oh, this is something that's completely unique, okay? What it means is that a process can go back and say, hey, can you send me the messages from a week ago, okay? That I, was, I subscribe to that. And we're gonna be able to, to do that, right? Because we have the data, okay? So uh, we, can, we can actually configure like how fast you want this data, like the pace that the data is coming in. Sometimes this is critical. Some processes, they require uh, the information coming in the right pace, right? So you don't flood the information, flood the consumer on the other end. Okay, so there are many different ways for you to control that, okay? <laughs> Plus, because we have historical data sitting there, right? So we, we're collecting all the data at the same time where, where the communication is happening. Um, admins can go back and look at the uh, message history to try to troubleshoot some, some old some problem that happened along the, along the process, okay? So just a quick picture here how the whole solution works, Fercom Edge uh, IoT Hub works. You can see here, these are some of the protocols we support right now on the left. Um, we're partners with PTC, so we have integration with ThingWorks. ThingWorks is one of the IoT platforms out there that are available. Our integration with ThingWorks is native. So if you are using ThingWorks today, you can definitely use Faircom Edge as a way to collect data from sensors and feed data back to ThingWorks, okay? So the way we work is really you can read data from anywhere and pump data anywhere you want, okay? We're kind of running out of time here, so I'm sorry, I tried to run really quick here. <laughs> For those that are watching this presentation right now, the webinar, we are running a special offer for a free 90 days proof of concept, okay? That gives you free evaluation license. You get free support for 90 days with our system engineers. So your support is not coming from, from sales or it's coming directly from the, from the engineers themselves. Um, and of course, we, we can help you with architecture questions. Um, we understand many of the IoT projects are 
going through uh, architecture questions. What's the best way to do this, right? How do I collect data? How, where do I, sh where should I persist it? You know, and then should I have a, a gateway? Should I have a single board computer sitting nearby? What's the best way to do those integrations? So we can help you with those architectures, okay? All you have to do is to, just to mention that you watch this webinar, okay? And I think, I think it's gonna be, uh, we're happy to help you, okay? To wrap it up here, just a brief explanation of who is Farcom. So we're not newbies, okay? We've been around since 1979. Customers all around the world, thousands and thousands of customers all around the world. Our business is mainly OEM and embedded systems. We have several plants and industries, environments, and we run in POSs, we run in satellites. Our technology runs all over the place, okay? It's a technology designed to be robust, mission critical, and resilient. Perfect for industry 4.0. Combine MQTT on top of it, and you can integrate any environment to any environment. Okay, I guess with that, I'm gonna open up for questions. Okay. And okay, uh, we've got some questions here. Uh, we have one question from an attendee wondering if you can explain the security requirements of MQTT. Sure, yeah, uh, MQTT, the protocol itself has some security uh, um, specifications already, especially on the on the new protocol, not shouldn't call it new, right? Version five, it's kind of old already, um, but it has its own uh, specs for security. We can we can send this more, more information after the webinar, but most of the communication that's going on, uh, most of the security for MQTT is based on communication, right? Data is flowing, it's data in transit. So what you have to do is really make sure that you're using uh, TSL, TSL, SSL, SSL, TLS, TLS. <laughs> for, the, for, yeah, see, for, the, for the communication protocol, certificates and everything else, okay? In our particular case, we have also data in, um, at rest because we're storing the data in our database. So for that, you have you have encryption, right? And you can have all the all the AES encryption that uh, our database provides, as well as security for uh, for user access and so on. Okay, it's a full database, so you have user control access, you know, and you ha you can decide how what to do. So make sure that you have implemented properly uh, uh, security for data transit and then for data at rest. Okay, I hope that answers the question, uh, Rich. All right, uh, we have a. Another question that says, uh, is the integration between the MQTT broker and the database native, or is it done via MQTT as well? It's a question for you, Walter, probably. Huh? Sorry, I was reading a different question. Uh, say that again. Sure, uh, is the integration between M the MQTT broker and the database native, or is it done via MQTT as well? Um, it's native, like I said, we have the the MQTT uh, plugin. Well, no, I guess I was thinking of the OPC UA plugin, but yeah, there's a separate plugin that handles the MQTT. It talks directly to our database, so it's a very tight, uh, very well managed native connection. Okay, we have another question that asks uh, if the network is unavailable, how do you recover when it reconnects? Yeah, that's a good question because, um, you know, things go up and down specifically if cellular is involved. Sometimes just if Wi-Fi is involved, you know, Ethernet is the most reliable, but sometimes people stick pins in the Ethernet or staple it to the wall or something or backhoe it. But anyway, if it goes down, then, you know, we keep track of the full state of each client of each um, MQTT subscriber and, and publisher. And then when it comes back up, we, of course, catch them up and deal with that appropriately. So. Great, I have another question here that asks, uh, how is Faircom Edge licensed? Is it per device or by data volume? Uh, that, I'll take that one. <laughs> yeah, it's per device, right? So Faircom Edge is, is, the, is licensed per number of units that you need. Uh, it's designed to be running on an edge computing gateway. So a single board computer. Um, it's essentially a, a fee per year, depending on how many how many you need. Okay, so you just have to decide how many gateways you need. You know, install for Comage on there, and it's a it's a subscription model. Okay, okay. Uh, it looks like we have one more question here asking um, if it persists messages with QoS. Um, that is a good question, Walter. Yeah. Do you know the answer to that? Um, yeah, yeah. It's uh, it basically. Um, so we will, I think the QoS mostly uh, defines the communication, but you know, as far as persisting it, as far as uh, saving it to disk and getting it on there, uh, that we pretty much always do that as QoS2, I guess that would be the equivalent. Because like, like Evaldo said, it's fully transactional, it's, it's all well-managed, so. 
Yeah, every data, every message that's flowing through the broker that we're running is being persisted, correct? Mm -hmm. Independently yeah, in, in, of, in the, of the transactional service, right? Huh? Yeah, in a transactional environment so that we get exactly one and, you know, we don't lose it and all that stuff. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. It looks like those are all of the questions that we have from our attendees today. Super. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, with that said, I think we just want to thank you guys for for watching us here today. Hey, apologies again for my cracking voice. What I can mention, <laughs> COVID's going around, so be careful. <laughs> and I think that's it, Walter. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks for listening. Great. And with that, D Zone would like to thank both Walter and Evaldo for a great presentation. We would also like to thank Faircom for providing the audience with an outstanding webinar. Lastly, thank you to everyone who attended today. We hope you learned something new that will help you in your developer career.